I want to talk about why science fiction and science fact blend together. And they blend together in the one great endeavor of the human species, which is to understand where we came from and how we fit in the universe. And in particular, the greatest, I want to talk about the greatest historical event that's ever going to happen. It has not happened yet for whoever it was that asked the question during the last thing, which is when we have clear, unequivocal contact with intelligence of another kind. Everything that Mike's doing, everything that Jay's doing, everything that was talked about today is all directed towards one primary goal. And that goal is to understand what we are in the context of the existence of life somewhere else in the universe. And now I'm going to make a statement that's controversial and I want to catalyze the conversation which goes like this. On the moment that human beings have clear unequivocal contact with intelligence of another kind, all previous history becomes unimportant. And from that point forward, the history of the human species will be diametrically different from anything that happened before. Now why do I say this? It's a question of time. For those of you who don't know the history of the universe, it goes like this. 13.7 billion years ago, plus or minus 50 billion. <laughs> we started. 50 million. 50 million. This is what Toby came up with. When I was a kid, they told me you'll never know better than 10 or 20 billion years. Oh, how little they do. Okay, so now we know this. The first third of the history of the universe, there was no Milky Way galaxy. The next third of the history of the universe, there was no solar system. Got it? We came along. We're the parvenus. Our solar system didn't even arrive until September in the cosmic calendar. It takes metallicity to produce intelligence. That means two star systems have to live and die in order to create the elements that make us. How fast could that have happened? It could have happened as fast as two or three billion years into the history of the universe. Meaning you can have any kind of distribution you want on the possibility of life starting, you with me, six billion years ago. So I make the following statement. It does not matter whether the extraterrestrials we encounter are malevolent, benevolent, or indifferent. It will be the most phenomenal event. It will absolutely change our history forever. Why? I will quote my good friend and partner, Arthur C. Clarke, with whom I worked for 10 years. Their technology will be indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> now, what are we doing now, today, to prepare for this event. Everything you saw today, in particular the first meeting where we talked about astrobiology, Pan Conrad, and Jan Agarbrody and Chris McKay, shows human beings are trying to open up their minds to prepare for this event. It has not happened yet. If I have a little time later on, I'll tell you about my participation in the Alien Abduction Convention. That's <laughs> <laughs> great fun. Uh, but it's like, I'm okay now. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 but, but I was told I had to finish everything I was going to say to get the conversation started in two minutes. Therefore, I'm not talking about the Alien Abduction Convention until someone asks me about it. <laughs> <laughs> As executive director of the Planetary Society, I'll just point out there's two questions that make humans crazy, or I hope you have stopped to think about at some point in your life, usually for most people before you're five, and that is where did we come from, and then are we find evidence of life on Mars, or kookier yet, if we were to find some sort of Martian microbe still going, still making a living on Mars, it would change the world would change the world forever, especially if it turns out to be uh, not just, just, <laughs> not the extraordinary thing of replacing phosphorus with arsenic and still having DNA, which is pretty cool, but some other entirely uh, second genesis and so on. So uh, to get this going, Gentry, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, what do you think we should be doing? You mean... Different than what, from what we're doing. Yeah, right we should all be writing stuff down. We should be uh, all get uh, dishes to keep an eye, keep watching the skies. Should we have to stock up on more hot cocoa or whatever? <laughs> like? What should we be doing? I cannot think of anything that we're not doing right now that is within our technological ken that we could do. There's a big argument about whether or not we should broadcast our existence. Too late. And it's way too late. For those of you who don't know, television gets out there. And if you imagine that the Federation Galactica has space stations that go around and pick up loose nonsense in an electromagnetic spectrum. How, from all how, how did you hear about that? Huh? Well, because I'm their local representative. <laughs> 
if, if, just think about this. Somebody out there right now, some intelligence could be looking at Adolf Hitler's speeches and howdy doody. That's just a little too much for us to, to imagine. And so I often say, you know, people want to craft a message for the future. They want to be rather for another civilization. And we got to have a committee. We got to write them. We got to get organized and make this message really important. No. What if the other guys, the other extraterrestrials, are just doing the same thing, and their Dick Van Dyke show is coming toward us? And it's just one of those deals. So, with that said, would you say that looking for water on Mars by extraordinary means, or extraordinary uh, by the next generation of of uh, techniques, isn't that consistent? with Gentry's idea that we should, this event is going to change the world when we find life elsewhere. Well, one of the things that concerns me, considering that they have a multi-billion year jump on us as far as technology. As far as we know. So, you know, they, they have magic. Statistically likely. Right? <laughs> they have magic. We're stuck with physics. <laughs> so, no, so their, my feeling is. Their physics <laughs> is magic. <laughs> Our so, physics. No, I understand. I understand. Right. And, uh, so I think one of the things that we should be progressing to getting ourselves off this one planet, so at least we have a potential refugia in case well, whoever discovers us decides that uh, we're just competition. So, oh, so what, <laughs> what, what planet do you recommend? Well, Mars is uh, at least the first step. No Venus, so. Now that, that, that was like the Judeo-Christian concept of hell. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not good. You don't want to go Venus, people. It, it's, uh, I'm going to tell a story, if you don't mind. I've been having fun today. Uh, it's, I do mean, not understand that the biggest star is a hell of a long way away. I'm going to tell a story. I was on uh, AM Cleveland once. And if any of you are from Cleveland, I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell you about this. And I was being interviewed by a beautiful young lady. could have been a beautiful young man. They're all the same. AM Cleveland, Cincinnati, Birmingham, whatever it is. And right in the middle of this they, live they say the same about Pasadena. That's right. Right in the middle of this conversation, this lady gets this, this is live. She says, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. She says, I'm not a futurist or a space scientist, and I can well imagine that we're going to have interstellar travelers and spacecraft within the next 15 years. What's your problem? Oh, 15 years? I said, right, yeah, this one. And I said, distance. She hit a little red button and we went off live and there was a brawny head coming on counting down 59, 58, 57, 56. <laughs> she leaned forward and over to me and she says, well, what's uh, Lynn, there's, I did my research. Is there something here I don't quite understand? So what's the problem with distance? I said, do you know how far it is to the nearest star? She said, yeah, it's only four or five light years. And I said, well, that's good. Do you know how far a light is? She said, no, but it doesn't matter. It's only four or five of them. <laughs> <laughs> and the light year was about six trillion miles, and I could tell from her eyes, she had no idea how many zeros were associated with six trillion miles. And finally, I reached, she had the most beautiful fingernails I've ever seen. And the Brontean, as the Brontean went off, I explained to her that the distance from the Earth to the most distant planet was the length of her fingernails, and the nearest star was out in Shaker Heights, which is a suburb. Yeah. <laughs> it is 8,000 times as far to the nearest star as it is to the most distant planet. Just remember that when you think we're going to spend, send spacecraft to the stars. And uh, uh, thank you, Gentry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, at the Planetary Society, are building a solar sail. Big fun. Uh, and we're hoping to uh, make it be, it'll be the first solar sail to orbit the Earth uh, with controlled flight. And as my colleague Lou Friedman loves to point out, the solar sail really ideal for going to another star system. All you have to do is get a civilization to beam a giant laser at it for 10,000 centuries. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't want to do that? But maybe Not our yet. physics, maybe our physics is incomplete, right? This is how we get beaming around. This is how we go warp. This is how we uh, just have to figure out how to use the dark energy. Yes, people. Ninety-four <laughs> <laughs> so, percent. Let's utilize. You gotta wonder. This is sounding more like Star Wars.